This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everyone, or welcome aboard. We're starting with some beautiful birchal starlings there. Aren't they just lovely? And a special and very warm welcome to the 57 families across the world that are joining us today. You can remember to send your kids questions as we dedicate the first 45 minutes of our drive to the wonderful kiddies. And you can use kids questions at wildearth.tv to share them with us. We'd love to get your questions. We'd love to talk to you. And even though they all might not come through, we'll do our best because we love chatting with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Trishala with Owen on camera this afternoon. It's quite warm. It's about 34 degrees Celsius or 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be a warm afternoon. But it'll start to settle around 5 o'clock when the sun gets a little softer. And we will be looking forward to that. So will these lovely creatures. So as it gets a little bit cooler... We can expect some wonderful things as the bush comes alive. With this heat, you'll find that animals have quite a lot of adaptations and lots of different behaviors that they will engage in, such as this. Ooh. These two starlings are getting very close. <laughs> so what they are doing is actually a great example of what some animals do in the heat, especially birds and reptiles, and that's called gula fluttering. Can you see that their beaks are just a little bit open, especially this one in front now? And their tongue and their throat area, the area we call the gula, is nice and moist. So when they have air come in there through evaporative cooling, the blood that's circulating around their body and around that gula and then travels around the body gets nice and cool. Just a perfect way to cool down on a hot African day. You can actually hear them calling a little as well. Let's be quiet. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? They always look a little bit shocked when they gula flutter like that. But they would be benefiting from cooler blood. Which is very important because animals can also overheat. They can also get a heat stroke. They can also get dehydrated. And they need to be nice and cool in order to survive. Very, very, very cool. Well, moving from a cool things to something very hot, it seems that Nikki at And Beyond Zingala wants to teach you guys how to make a fire out in the wild. So let's go over to him to say good afternoon and do his experiment. Good afternoon to all the kids that are currently um, watching this. Uh, you're talking to Nikki from And Beyond Zingala, and behind the camera is Marcel. And so this morning we said we wanted to make a challenge to see if who can make a fire with two sticks, or if we can make a fire with two sticks. And um, just to show you what I got is, so I managed to go and cut a piece of wood, and you'll see like I made it quite flat. You, I have used this one before, but hopefully we can get one this afternoon. I've just put my knife here, and I'll tell you why I've done that in a, a little while. And then right over here, I just went and I cut a normal piece of branch, and I took an old shoelace, and I tied it up, and then right over here, I have a little spindle. I made. I actually made two little spindles. And here, a little handle for this one to fit in. So this is uh, one of the ways that we're going to try and make fire out in the bush. So I would recommend not to do this at home unless you are with your parents. And as well as it is an open area, you can see I've decided to come into a riverbed because the last thing you want to do is make a fire and then it lights anything around you. So you need to make sure that if you do this, it has to be in a very safe environment. Now... On this side here, I have some elephant dung. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bow like this, wrap it around, and then put it right over here like that. And then I'm going to saw this wood. And then hopefully, with the two woods on top of each other through friction, we'll be able to get a coal. And I'll take that coal and put it into the elephant dung, and then hopefully we can make a fire. So, shall we give it a go? Okay, I haven't tried this yet today, so let's see if we can get a fire going.
Okay. We managed to get a coal. Let's see if we can put this coal. Let's see if we can put this in the elephant dung. So it's really important now that when we pick this up, we don't lose our coal. Right, kids, you ready for this? Let's do it. So, when you want to make this fire, you have to be very careful. It's like a nest. If you push too hard, you're going to kill it. If it's too loose, it might fall through it. You have to just put enough pressure on it and keep it there. There we go. We got a fire. Okay, so now, if we were out in a survival situation, we would put more branches on this, and eventually we can go and look for something to eat and then cook it on the fire. But for now, because remember I said fire is not always a good thing out in the bush because if it runs away, it could burn quite a lot of um, grass and trees and that's what the animals would eat. So what we want to do is we want to kill this fire now. The best way for me to kill this, there's some wet river sand, so I'm going to put that in here. And I'm going to cover it with sand. And by doing that, I'm going to kill that fire. All right. Well, what do you say after our fire, we go see if we can find those white lines this afternoon? All right, so while I get ready and into the vehicle and get all my stuff ready, let's head across to James. Good afternoon and welcome to my end of the Sunset Safari. I'm very, very deeply jealous of Nikki because I'm actually unable to start a fire even if I have a box of matches and a box of fire lighters and a packet of very dry wood. So the fact that Nikki can do it without any of that stuff makes me very jealous indeed. Anyway, uh, perhaps one day he shall teach me how it is done. I am James Hendry, in case you were wondering. On camera is David. There he is. And I'm wandering about in this bush hoping to find a leopard called Shidulu. We think that she came down this road sometime yesterday evening and that she perhaps had a kill stolen from her. She... The footprints on the road of the leopard are being followed very clearly by the footprints of a hyena. And not far from here, we had Ribbon, who is matriarch of the Juma clan, with a very, very fat belly uh, this morning. And so it looked like she'd eaten something. So the conclusion I've drawn is that maybe she stole a kill from the leopard called Shidulu in this area. That's my guess. Please send us any questions that you have. Of course, you can do that too at wildearth.tv you have to the ages of 13 up until quarter past four. everyone can okay we're going to go across to Trishala she's already found what she's set out to yes I was very very happy when I came across this beautiful elephant and he is a bull that's what we call a male elephant and he's going around eating as much as he can. And he's also showing you some of those behaviors that animals will do when it's warm. And that's walking through patches of shade. Hello, boy. You are very large. Yes, you are very large. Hello. Hello, Roma and Ruby. You'd like to know how heavy is the average elephant bull? Did I hear that correctly, or was it the elephant poo? <laughs> what an interesting question. I can't say anybody has asked me what the average weight of elephant poo is, but it is very light, believe it or not. That's probably one of the reasons that Nikki used it in order to start the fire because it's very fibrous and it's very very light 
I would say not even more than about 50 grams or so per per poo. <laughs> um, they come in little little kind of balls. But a big guy like him, this guy here, in total for the day. Oh, I think he's going to show you, girls. There we go. There you go, girls. He's showing you exactly how they come out, like little round balls. <laughs> So on average, they a big bull like this, because he's quite large, will eat about 300 kgs of food per day. And he'll excrete, that means he poo out about 150 of those kgs per day. So what you just saw as he went around doing that, he does that many, many times a day. Many times. And he eats throughout the day too. In fact, out here in the bush, sometimes you get a little bit... Um, board and you want to play some sport and we have often played catch with a good elephant poo. It's because it's nice and tight. Oh, I think he's going to go to the watering hole. Let's go around. Hello Isabel and Ryan. You'd like to know how large can an elephant tusk grow? They can go pretty big. I'll show you. So the one that we just saw now, he's only got one tusk. Did you notice that? And uh, that is about, looks like it's about, uh, I'd say 60 centimeters or less. Uh, he's playing with me, people. He's playing with me. He's going to the smaller watering hole. That's okay. We'll go see him there too. But they can get much larger. They can get to two about the height of me. 1.2 meters, that's not my, my, my height, or 1.5 meters, and we call those ones with big, large tusks, we call them tuskers. They can be very long, but because of poaching and other things like that, it has become much smaller in many, many individuals. There he is, he's going to go have a drink. Liliana and Billy in Yorkshire. Hello, it's so nice for you guys to join us. You'd like to know how we can tell the different moods of the elephants? Look at him having a drink. Well, there's a couple things we look for. You can actually see in their eyes. So generally when you look at their eyes, you can't really see the whites of the eye. And when they are not happy with you, they kind of get a little bit wide-eyed. And you'll begin to see a bit of white on either side. That's one thing we look for. The other thing is the way that they carry themselves, the way that they walk, the way that they, oh, the way that they move around with their heads. They can lift their heads up very tall and very strong and they push out their ears to make themselves appear very big. Isn't this lovely? And that makes them look very impressive. And basically what they want to do by giving you those signals is let you know that I'm big and I'm strong and don't mess with me. It's a deterrent. It means I'm going to stop you before you even try anything with me. And when they're in a good mood, you'll see that they'll just continue to eat. They won't really pick their head up very much. They won't pay you too much attention. And even if they do pay you some attention, they are very relaxed about it. It's a difficult thing to describe because it's, it's very much a feeling. And if you are anxious and nervous because there's this big animal around you, they can tell. And they don't like it. Lou, I'm just going to get that name from you again while we watch this lovely bull displaying to us some of the ways that he gets... <laughs> while he shows us how he deals with the heat. Matthew, you'd like to know why? Are those ears are so big? Well, that's another reason that uh, elephants do well in the heat. That's why they're out and about like this. And another way in which he'll use his body to be able to get rid of heat. Your ears, Matthew, just like these elephants' ears, have very, very thin skin on them. And that means that any blood that goes through your ears gets cooled down very quickly. 
And if the blood gets cooled down quickly, it means that overall you feel nice and cool. Now, did you see Matthew when he was putting his trunk into the water and throwing the water onto him? That he actually aimed for his ears quite a bit and that's because it's an extra cooling effect and he has a very large big veins and arteries behind his ears so all that blood in his body can go through the ears and get nice and cool in fact he can take all the blood in his body and push them through the ears and round again in just 20 minutes and now he's hiding behind the tree for us I was hoping he'd go down for a swim. I think he might. Let's get up onto the damn wall and see if he's going to go down for a swim. Now also, Matthew, did you see that he was waving his ears? He was picking them out, in and out like that. That wind on a nice, as you would know, when you come from the beach or you jump out the pool and there's wind, you suddenly feel very cold. Well, that's what he's done. He's waving his ears around so that you get a breeze going on the water that's on the ears and that makes it even cooler in fact he's probably feeling great right now and if he's going down for a swim he'll be feeling even better I'm so glad that we could find some elephants I really wanted to in the morning or in the afternoon when I spoke to James I said I want to find some elephants and he said him too all right I hope that he's going for a swim but we're going to send you over to the new fire starter at Ampion's in Gala. Let's go back to Nikki. Seeing all those elephants with Trishala at the moment. So what I'm thinking is we want to go back to those lines and see if they are still in the area where we saw them this morning. So this is the lines with those very, um, with the small white uh, cub and the older young male. Um, but for now, I'm hoping that we can go past one of the waterholes, see if there's anything there, if they might have moved in that direction. But then eventually from there, we're going to still make our way back to those lions. It was a very warm day, so I'm just thinking with lions, you can imagine if it's warm, they probably just don't want to move too far. So they might have even gone off the road and laid down in some of, you'll see some of the trees here, there's quite a lot of shade. Maybe even under a tree to get a bit of a shade and get out of the heat. Abigail, um, age eight in England, you were asking if lions are endangered, and if so, why? Well, according to my knowledge, they're not endangered in the area where we are now. Like some areas, they might be threatened. And the main reason why it might be like that is because, of course, uh, could be because of the, them losing their habitat, could be conflict with people and I would say that's probably going to be the main reason sometimes they just lose their habitat where they can stay and as well as the conflict with with people around and that's why they will be threatened you do often get like things possibly diseases or maybe um, hyenas killing lions in, in some areas but most often lions are the top predators and the only other threat to them would be something bigger or stronger and often that could be people. Jack, age six from England, you were asking what does endangered mean? So endangered, I'm trying to find the best way to describe it. It was when there's not a lot left of them. It's, it's getting to a stage where there's a chance that all of them might die out. Um, so just to give you an idea, if something is not endangered, it means there's a lot of them. But once they start getting endangered, it means there's only a few left. And if we don't look after them, then those few will eventually disappear. Oh, and I also wanted to say to Chloe, age 12, 
I got a beautiful drawing of a lion or a few lions laying in the road this morning. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for drawing that picture and sending it on to me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm going to print it and put it up in my room. So, Chloe, age 12, you... Oh, there's some kudu in the road. Just, I'll get back to your question right now. Just want to quickly have a look. So that one has moved off into the bush, and often that's what kudu would do. As soon as you get closer, um, they often move into a bit of a denser area just to hide away from whatever might be around them. But you'll see as we go closer... Maybe we can get a, a bit of a closer view of them. Let's just move slowly forward so we don't disturb them. There we go. And just see her face peeking above the bush. You'll notice like with this female, she has like quite a lot of white around her mouth and very big ears. Now with kudu in general, whenever they move, they tend to stick to quite dense areas. And the reason why she wants to be in a dense area is because then she, the lions might not see her. Because whenever lions see kudu, they might want to go for them. Um, and catch them. So that, therefore, Kudu has to really make use of these dense areas to try and hide away from them. They'll use those big ears, and as soon as anything moves in the grass, they'll be able to hear it and then run away. See, she's just, while she's looking at us, look at how she's taking it ears and, and directing it um, behind her, just to make sure that there's nothing moving behind her. So, Claire, I just wanted to answer the question. In order to become a game ranger, um, you don't necessarily have to study zoology or geology in order to become a ranger, but you have to be 21 years old, um, be able to have a PDP, so a public driver's permit, and then just some form of a guiding qualification. So, a lot of guides uh, go through an organization called FAGASA. It's the Field Guiding Association of South Africa that you can do courses with. Um, but I would definitely, even like for us with and beyond, is we do an internal training program where we um, join up with, it's called the Quasi Ranger Training Course, and then you join up for six and a half weeks. And during that time is you get training to become a ranger. And after that, you get based at a lodge. So I was based at uh, and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve, and from there on, I started my training as a ranger, and then from there on, I came on to and beyond in Gala. But you can either, there's a lot of ways to approach it, but you don't necessarily have to study zoology or geology in order to become a guide. But when you do start studying it, the more you know about that, about all those different things like the geology um, and the animal behavior and all of that, the more it helps you as a guide. See, another one came closer just to, to have a look at us. But how well camouflaged. I mean, look at how dark they are in that. Alicia, you were asking if uh, kudu are the largest antelope we see. So there are bigger antelope. Um, I'm hoping that I can just show you a picture of one. I haven't seen one yet through this area, but you do find them. It's something called an eland. So if I can just show you right over here, this would be probably the biggest antelope um, that you could find in this area. And they nearly weigh um, close to a ton. So that just shows you how big they are. So a lot bigger than that kudu. But the kudu is almost as tall as this eland. So this is a fully grown male kudu with these spiral horns. And this is the eland right over here. But for the day, it's definitely the biggest antelope we have seen.
We are going to carry on towards that water hole. Let's head across to James with a bird of prey. We have got a bird of prey here. And I know the picture is not the best because it's very difficult to film something straight into the sun like this. But it's a tawny eagle, as far as I can make out. Now, the tawny eagle is a scavenger a lot of the time. And when they're not sitting on the end of a tree exposed, it leaves me slightly suspicious as to what they're doing here. So could there perhaps be a carcass, some meat around, that was killed by a leopard? That is a possibility. It's also possible the tawny eagle's just enjoying the shade. What you can also hear is a very angry squirrel just behind there going And that's what they do when they're really cross. David thinks that's funny. Uh, and it's either alarming at the tawny eagle, which is quite possible, or perhaps there is a predator in this very deep thicket here. So it's probably worth my while going in, on, in there on foot just to have a look and see if perhaps there isn't a spotted cat sitting on a carcass or just sitting. So I shall probably do that in due course. And so while I do that, we'll go back across to Trishala, who is, uh, I think, probably still with her elephant. My Ellie has moved off to a thick area where I can't see him anymore. But we are at a different pan, and this pan has pumped water. So we thought maybe he'd come this way since he was heading in this direction. But in the meantime, I've also found for you something special. Some elephant dung. It is the size of my head, everyone. It's probably the size of your head, too. And obviously, it depends on the type of animal, size of animal it's come out of. But here we go, and it is quite heavy. What, what can I compare it to? It's probably about 100 grams, but it's also a little bit wet. You can still see the wetness around there. So when we weigh things, especially if we want to be scientific about it, we want to be very accurate about it, then we have what we call dry weight and we have wet weight. So this is wet weight and wet means heavier than a normal. So dry weight would be about half that. It's very easy to pick up and throw and do whatever you like with it. But wet weight is a little bit heavier. In fact, probably double the weight. So how much does one liter of water weigh, kiddies? That's an easy way to remember. One liter is one kg. So water is heavy. It is. So water adds weight to it. It's very easy to hold with one hand. Here even a few fingers. It's a little bit messy but it's also perfectly safe to hold. And that's because elephants only eat, only eat vegetation. And it's always important when we do experiments and other things to clean up afterwards, isn't it? I like to do experiments. And Henko, you like to know how much water does an elephant drink in a day? Around a, oh, that was a spider's web. Around a hundred liters, if not more. In fact, in that trunk of this, oh, hello you. In that trunk of this, they can store many, many liters of water. Tens of liters of water. And they'll need to eat to drink as much water as they need. 
which is anything from about 150 to 300 litres. This is a leopard tortoise, everyone. It's our first leopard of the day. I'm going to count it. And it's quite a nice big one. Hello, gorgeous. It's trying to get away from me. Leopard tortoises are shy. That's why it's so exciting to see them. Hello. You're shy. Can you see the nice big round shell? And it's a little bit spotty. That's why it's called a leopard tortoise. And they can grow very old. They can grow to about 75 years old. Now we call that top part of the shell. It's carapace. And then under bit, it's plastron underneath its belly and there it goes escaping into the bush trying to hide away from me oh well at least we got a view well Nikki in and beyond in Gala has some hippos to show you so let's go over to him at that watering hole so we just found some hippos in the water and I just wanted to know from all the kids if you wanted to know what my grandfather told me when I was probably around seven, eight years old of why hippos laugh. Because often when hippos, if they call, they have this, <laughs> almost sounds like they are laughing. Let me know if any of the kids want to know that and I'll tell you the story. Okay, so when I was a young boy, I remember the one day we were walking along the side of a river. And as we were walking, we just heard these hippos in the distance go like, <laughs> and I like completely froze. I didn't know what was going on or what it was or what was making that noise. And I asked my grandfather, I said to him, like, what is making that, that noise? And he said, those are hippos laughing. And I said, hippos laughing can't be. And he said, no, they are, because what they do is they're very good animals in the animal kingdom. So they can't just go around and tell naughty jokes and gossip because the other animals look up to them. It's almost like they're role models. So what they would do is they go under the water where nobody can hear them. And they start telling these naughty jokes. And then they burst out of the water and go like, <laughs> and they'll start laughing about it. I even got Marcel to laugh in the back. <laughs> Wow, just be, I just wanted to point out behind these hippos, there's some interesting birds sitting. Um, you'll notice they have this black color um, on the wings, bit of white on the, on the tail, some white around the neck and a grayish bill with like, looks like it's, there's a little splash of red at the end. It's called the woolly neck stalk. And um, over the last, I would say maybe month, month and a half, I haven't seen any woolly neck stalks, and today was the first day. I wonder if it's, it might have to do with the heat um, and them coming to more of a, of a prominent uh, water hole, one where there's often um, quite a lot of water and doesn't just necessarily dry up. Grace and Anna, you were asking a very interesting question. What is the biggest thing hippos would eat? So hippos mainly eat grass. So what they would do is, in the, uh, like late in the evening, as soon as it starts cooling down, they'll move out into the grass behind them and they'll start feeding off the grass. Now, interesting enough though, they, are, they mainly eat grass, but it has been recorded before where they sometimes, um, especially if an impala or something got stuck, that they'll often nip at those impalas, uh, especially if they're dead, they'll, you'll find them chewing it, but they don't necessarily swallow it. But hippos aren't designed to, to eat meat. They more, um, they just eat the grass in the back. Well, 
Oliver, Ava and Lily, you were asking a very good question. If hippos go under the water, how long can they stay underwater? Now, I've, myself and a few rangers have, have timed that as well. So if you read some of the books or even go on the internet, you'll find that they can normally stay six minutes under the water without having to take a breath. And we've timed it before and anywhere from four and a half to six minutes on the dot, they'll, they'll come up again to breathe. Sometimes it might look like they're under the water for a longer period of time, but if you look closely with binoculars, you will just see two nostrils sticking out of the water. The McAllister family from Cape Town, you were asking why, like how big or how wide can a hippo open his mouth? Now, I used to know exactly the, the degree of it, but I am not too sure at the moment. Like, I would really love if, if anyone knows more about it or, or what the angle would be. I do know when they open their mouth, it almost looked like a, it's pretty close to 150 160 degrees but i would like to hear from if anyone knows a bit more about the exact um, degree of how or angle at, at how big they can open their mouth Louise, um, 11 from Germany, you were asking how big um, or how heavy is a hippo. Like, I would say, like, it all depends on, on of course, the size of the hippo. A baby would be probably around three, four hundred kilograms, some of the, the bigger ones. Um, but then they can go well over a ton. But I would say these ones that are currently in the water, they'll probably be like around one and a half. Um, maybe close to two tons. I just wanted to... I'm going to send you back to James in a little while. I just wanted to point out before you go, have a look at the Kingfisher. Um, that's sitting on that branch. It looks like a Woodlands Kingfisher, very bright orange beak, um, bit of blue on the shoulder. But for now, let's head across to James and I'll see everyone soon. I have found myself a knob billed duck. And it doesn't have a knob bill because it is a female duck i.e. not a drake. And it looks very odd sitting perched on the edge of that dead tree. What it is doing there, I cannot imagine. But perhaps it too is looking for leopards like us. And its vantage that much more, well, useful from there. Oh, there it goes. Duck down into the pond. Let's go around the corner. There's a little puddle around the corner here. I went off and had a look in that bush and I'm afraid the tawny eagle flew away, the squirrels stopped alarm calling and I didn't find anything around that tree. So we're going to continue and see what else comes our way. Hello, Hanno. You're 12 years old and want to know about fish eagles and if we get them here. We do, Hanno. At the waterholes, we often see fish eagles. I haven't seen one for a couple of weeks, but yeah, I know we do get them, for sure. They tend to like rivers or really big dams. You see our duck in there? No, he's all... She is all hidden, I'm afraid, by the grass. As are most of the leopards, of course because the grass is so very long. Now we'll see what else we can see. What we're going to do is head around towards a water hole and see what's over there. 
the Verbin boys. We get some tremendously sophisticated questions from very young children. From where are they, Louise? Cyprus. Ah, lovely to have you all the way from Cyprus. Verbin boys, you're wondering why safaris are important, age three and five. Most impressive question. Um, safaris are important because what they do is they provide money to areas like this. Now, the way the world runs at the moment, it is such that it's very difficult for people to keep areas like this without those areas generating some kind of money. Now, I know it's a little bit complicated, but basically, safaris help these areas pay for themselves. They pay for the roads, they pay for the police to look after them, they pay for the fences, they pay for the vets, they pay for all sorts of things. So that's why safaris are important on one level. Secondly, safaris are really important because they help educate people about the wilderness. Now, the wilderness is very important to human beings. Some human beings are inescapably ignorant of that fact, but it is very true that nature, without nature, we as a species, we as human beings, would really struggle to survive. And so safaris are important because they help people to connect with nature. And that's what we're hoping to do on our safaris. So I hope that you're connecting to nature through us and that you'll come out and see this magical wilderness area for yourself one day. That would be great. Right, Nicky is having a lot of luck this afternoon, so let's go over to him. He's got himself some elephants. So, welcome back to Ambion Ngala. We just found three elephants. I don't know if there might be more in the herd, but currently there's a youngster off to the right, and the two bigger ones um, just in front of us at the moment. Um, we just want to have a look at the... It looks to me they might be heading down to that water where we just came and we saw those hippos earlier. And you can imagine with elephants, it's been a very warm day, and also looking at them, it doesn't look like they have been to the water now recently, so they might just be heading down um, there eventually. So let's sit here and have a look and see what they might be up to in the next little while. Tana, age four, you were asking if an elephant's tusk falls off, will it grow back? Now, it all depends on where it breaks. So let's say, I'm just trying to see if we can get one just to show the tusks. Now, if the tusk breaks off the tip, so like, let's say from where you can see it, see that one that's moving out now? So let's say if you can still see the tusk and it breaks off and there's still a part of it that you can see, then it will still continue growing. But if the tusk breaks off quite deep um, into or uh, near the mouth and it breaks off really deep, it won't be able to grow back. So just to answer that question, it depends on where it breaks. If it breaks really deep um, into the cavity, it won't unfortunately grow back. But if it just breaks off at the tip, it will then just push out. And eventually, as she pushes over trees and, and rubs up against trees with that tusk, she might sharpen it again. But it will be a lot shorter than the other one. You'll just hear now and then this big female is just flapping her ears. Liam, I'm going to get to age 12 from Botswana. I'm going to get back to you now with your question about how long elephants live. I just wanted to point out, if you notice with this female, she's constantly flicking her ears. And what she's doing is she's just trying to cool herself down. You see that? Just imagine a warm day, and one of the ways of cooling yourself down is just to flap those ears. But to get back to your question, um, they get up to, they can live up to 60 years in, uh, on average. Sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit less, but normally you're looking around about 60 years. 
Liam, I'd like to know where you are from in Botswana, because my parents are currently in Botswana as well. Well, my mother is there at the moment. She lives up in Celebe Pique. Just rubbing her eye. I think she might have just gotten some sand in her eye. We'll just wait for her to move off a little bit, because if we do push uh, forward on the road, we might be a bit too close to her, and it may, might make her feel a bit uncomfortable. Let's just give her some time. As soon as she moves off a little bit, we'll try and see if we can get another view of them. Autumn, age seven, from Pennsylvania. Um, you were asking, are elephants really scared of mice? Now, I have heard the rumor that that is true, but I don't know. Like, I've never seen it um, in real life. I've never seen an elephant running from anything other than, especially with all the bulls from other elephants, um, or possibly if they want to move away with the youngsters away from lions. But I don't know too much about a mouse. I don't know if you might have heard something about it or if anyone has seen it. I've just never seen it. But apparently, there are rumors that it might be. I don't know. It would be nice to, to know if, if anyone knows anything about it. Should we try and move slightly closer? And um, They have moved off a bit from where the road is, just to see if we can get another glimpse of them. Right, while we're trying to see if we can get another glimpse, let's go back to Trish. You're back with me and you're watching a giraffe. <gasps> Two lovely giraffe, one calf with a female. Walking off into the bushes. And there's a very thick part. Oh, they're coming out again, just slightly for us to see. Gorgeous they are. Beautifully tall. Slender and elegant. Aren't they just beautiful? Now, they are hiding from us. Oh, and we're out again. <laughs> I love to see a good giraffe. I really do. But I must say that this brings... Our 45 minutes dedicated to our beautiful kitties to an end. So we invite everybody else to come send in their questions as well. And kids, you can continue watching also. But everyone else is going to get a chance to ask their questions. And they're going to do that using the hashtag Wild Earth or the YouTube chat stream or Twitch. And you can ask us whatever you like about these wonderful giraffes. Just gorgeous. All right, well, I've introduced you to these. I've seen three giraffes here now, and I'm going to reintroduce myself to all of you that are coming on board for our non-kids session, shall we call it, or uh, our everybody session. It's me, Trishala, with Owen on camera this very warm afternoon, 34 degrees Celsius, 93 Fahrenheit. It's warm. Um, but that means that our animals that are not predators, like our giraffes, our elephants, really lovely, beautiful, big animals might be out and about because they have adapted to dealing with this heat. And I'm really, really hoping for some elephants playing in the water. That would be awesome. Giraffe playing in the water? I'd love to see it, but I doubt that we will. <laughs> Anything playing in the water would just be gorgeous. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go to some of the watering holes. So I'm going to stick around the north. And maybe Buffalo's Hook Dam. Hi, play it. Oh, look at that tongue. You'd like me to explain necking with the giraffes. Necking is really interesting. So obviously you can see that giraffes have very long necks. And there are a couple of reasons why that may be. One is that it allows them to take advantage of a resource that other animals cannot. That is the tops of trees. 
which is fair. Then we have that perhaps a long neck was more appealing to females. So we have sexual selection at play here. So the longer the neck, those animals were more likely to mate and reproduce. So there we have advantage of a new res of a resource others can't get. So they're excluding competition. We have sexual selection. So those with longer necks breed better. And then there's the other one. And this is where necking comes in. And that is males can fight for females in a quite a violent way called necking in which they will knock each other's necks and animals have actually broken necks like that because that's a very strong area of their body in fact their, most of their weight lies in the front portion of their body so they knock each other with those necks and of course with those ossicones at the top of their head there which is why males usually have bolder ones or more bold ossicones, that's because they're constantly engaging in, in fight with each other for females. Oh, that is very cute, that looks like a sculpture. Yes, you do. <laughs> very sweet. So there we have three reasons, or possible reasons, why that neck is that large. So basically necking is fighting for females in a way that they can, and the way that they can do that is hitting necks together. So there you go. But most likely it's a combination of those things that caused that long, long neck. Well, they look lovely. And although they are the very most tall of the mammals we have here, James has uh, the largest and most in charge. So let's go to him. No, I don't have a blue whale with us here, Tashana. I have got an elephant, Loxodonta africana, eating some grass. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm 99% sure it's exactly the same audience we've had up until this point. Uh, lovely to have you with us uh, for the uh, more mature side of the drive. My name is James Henry David. Still sans beard is on camera this afternoon. And that is an elephant's bottom. Now, that elephant has got huge tusks. And so I think we're going to go around and see if we can get a better view of him. Oh, it's not my pillow, no, Louise. It's a, uh, it's actually my secret stash of beans. I like to take beans on drive with me, Louise. Louise, by the way, is in the final control room. The final control room is here at Juma. And what Louise does, and Kirsten does, and Natalie does, they're the three directors, they receive all three feeds, so from me, from Trishala, and from Nikki, and they then choose which has got who's got the best content and they then send out whatever's the best we hope and they also monitor the social media feeds for your questions and your comments and so that's basically how a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what we do is that all right david so this chap's got pretty big tusks he's not as what is that uh, windscreen wipers on. He's not as big or as old as the must bull we saw this morning with a floppy ear, but he's got much bigger tusks or much heavier tusks, I'd say. I do apologize for any problems with the sound. Apparently, it's going pop, pop, pippity, pop, pop. Hopefully, that will fix it better yes. good now watch how the elephant picks the grass and then shakes off all the dirt and then places it deftly into his mouth now that's because he doesn't like dirt and because he doesn't want to wear his teeth out too quickly perhaps I'm not sure he realizes however that his teeth are going to wear out one day something so very peaceful about sitting with elephants like this. In a peaceful way, they flap their ears and move their trunks in time. <laughs> Nikita, age 12, I don't know if elephants get heartburn when they are pregnant. I imagine it's possible. You know, I've never been pregnant myself, and 
Unless there's something I really don't know about myself, I'm highly unlikely to get pregnant at all during my lifetime. I'm not sure what causes heartburn in pregnant women, is why I'm telling you that. I don't know if it's got something to do with diet or if it is because the uterus pushes up against the stomach and therefore uh, creates an acid reflux up into the esophagus. I don't know what causes it in human beings. It probably is the latter. Louise is agreeing with me, although her experience of childbirth is the same as mine. Um, I think, therefore, that elephants probably don't get it, and I'll tell you why, because their stomach is very different from ours, and the fore stomach is not nearly as filled with acid as ours is. Ours is very acidic because we eat a lot more refined um, foods. We eat meat, obviously. We're able to digest meat. This elephant would be unable to digest meat, and so there's a lot of acid in our stomachs, and that stomach is very close to the esophagus, which is very close to the heart. Now, I think with an elephant, what you'll find is that most of the acid digestion takes place uh, much further down the digestive tract and probably wouldn't be able to, you know, once she gets very pregnant, it probably wouldn't push up into the esophagus and cause, cause heartburn. I'm really guessing here, though, Nikita, so I don't know. Don't quote me on this, uh, but I, I'm going to say no, I don't think so. You must remember, Nikita, that, you know, a lot of our problems like heartburn and that sort of stuff are caused by things like our diet, like the things we eat, which are not necessarily particularly good for us and create a lot more acid than we might want. Charlotte, I missed your question. I'm sorry, I was waffling on. Let's have it again. Louise will give it to me. Oh, it's your 10th birthday. Happy birthday, Charlotte. The ear, ears are big, Charlotte. Happy birthday to you. Um, I would sing to you. In fact, I'm going to sing to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Charlotte. Happy birthday to you. And once in Shangan, Ukurile swe swe, Ukurile swe swe, Ukurile wena Charlotte, Ukurile swe swe. Hey, pip pip, hooray. Well done, Charlotte. Ten years old. Uh, one decade on planet Earth. What was your question again? Oh, yes. <laughs> Why are their ears so big? Charlotte, their ears are so big because they need to cool their brains. So if you look carefully at their ears, you'll be able to see that there's a lot of venation. In other words, there are lots of veins. I'm sure you know what veins are in the ears. And those veins carry blood. And every time he flaps his ears, that blood cools down and then it flows into his big brain. And by flowing into his big brain cooled, it keeps his brain cool on a hot day. Now, the brain is the most important organ to keep cool, because if it overheats, all the systems of your body will shut down. It's a little bit like if the... I'm not sure if this is going to help you at all, but basically it's like in a computer, if the... Hard, if the hard drive, which contains all the information and tells the computer what to do, if that gets too hot, nothing else will work. And so it's a little bit like that, where if the brain gets too hot, the heart will stop working, the liver will stop working, the lungs will stop working. So it's very important that he keeps his brain cool. And because we live in a hot environment, and these African elephants, elephants all live in a hot environment, they have to have these big ears to keep the brain cool. And what's interesting is that because they don't live in jungles, in thick forest, like, say, Indian elephants do, or Asian elephants do, they have much bigger ears than Asian elephants. And Asian elephants have got smaller ears because they tend to live in more shade than our elephants. Isn't that interesting? Right. I might sit with this little, this big chap for a little bit longer. While I do that, Trishala has now got a butterfly and a giraffe. I wish it was that dramatic. 
but I think uh, our giraffe has walked away. But we'll have a look again in a moment. Oh no, Spotted Joker! That was a Spotted Joker butterfly, everyone. Thought it was also gonna leave me, but you're back! No, you're just playing hard to get you come back and you leave me again. Oh no. So giraffe, let's have a, a look through the spot where our giraffes were. Oh! <laughs> we see you. I kind of feel like this giraffe is hiding behind the curtain in your home during hide and seek. I can tell that you're there. Got some ox peckers bothering it. Oh, and you're out. There we go. Hello, Intando. You'd like to know how do we know if a giraffe is a, if a, is a girl or a boy? Ooh, they're all coming in now. Now let's look at the tops of the ossicones. Those are the little parts at the top of the head of the of the giraffe, and you can see the one on the right is just moving. Have no hair at the top. He's bald. Can you can you see that she's He's bald at the top, it's nice and round. Now that's what usually happens with the boys. And there's only hair around. I'm sure that you have some uncles like that, Nintendo. I know I do. That's how we can tell that they're male. And also, male giraffes are much bigger than female giraffes. They weigh about 900 to 1,200 kgs. So that's quite a bit. Females are a little bit less than that, sometimes even half their weight, sometimes even just 700 kgs. So we look at that, and the most important thing to look at, even though it may seem strange, but it's the most correct way, is to just look underneath the giraffe and see if you can look, if you can see male parts or no parts, and that'll tell you if it is a male or a female. That is the best way to do it. Um, there's other factors, even with elephants, we say that a round forehead means that it's a male, and um, a very sharp forehead means a female, but that's not the most accurate way to detect that. The most accurate way is to simply look at whether it's got male parts or female parts. That is the best way, like you would with your dog or cats. Speaking of cats, Nikki at and Beyond Zingala has some lions for you, so let's go to him. So welcome to Ambion and Gala um, with um, the guide Nikki and then Marcel is with us doing all the camera work. I just wanted to point out we found the pride of white lines um, or the two white lines in the part of the what's known as the burning of pride and and they haven't moved too far from where we saw them this morning. Now if you look at them at the moment they're all just laying down it is getting um, quite later on in the day and I saw a few of them moving around getting closer and closer I think from where they were this morning until now they haven't even moved a hundred meters so you can see they're very relaxed and I'm thinking hoping that because they've been laying down in this whole area during the morning and into this late afternoon that they might start moving pretty soon um, but it is still pretty warm so we'll have to sit here for a while and, and see what happens You can see there's one of them at the very back, quite a youngster that's fighting the flies. Charmaine, you were asking how old do lions get now? With most females, they'll get anywhere from between um, 14 to 18 years of age. So normally in general, like around about 15, 16 years. Um, and the males, if they live longer than 12 years, they had a very good life. They normally tend to, because of the fights and um, often whenever they, they get in contact with other males and they fight for territories, they do get, walk away with quite serious injuries. And normally they won't grow older than 12, 13 years in a, um, 
in an era like this. Martin, age three, you were asking what den do lions live in? Now, these lions, at the moment, they don't live in any den. So they just basically, wherever they end up in the, at night or in the day, that's where they'll spend um, their time. But if the mother had to bear youngsters, what she'll do is she'll often go um, into like something like a cave or... Maybe it could even be possibly an old dugout termite mount, and that's where she'll hide the youngsters away. A really dense bush, so a, a, a really dense area where um, other predators might not necessarily be able to, to see it. Because at the other hand, she's trying to hide them away um, from the pride. Because um, you can imagine a very young lion, as soon as the pride sees them, they'll probably want to play and get interactive, and they, and they could um, kill those little ones. But also, the other thing is a hyena could be potential danger or even rock python. So she needs to make sure that she hides it away um, in an area where they normally won't be able to get to them. You see, the flies are just bothering this one so much, he decided, let me rather get up. I wonder if he might, I just want to see if it's a he or she. I couldn't see properly. It's still a very young one. Um, probably come closer to the rest of the pride. There's quite a lot of flies around that one. <laughs> it's just constantly using the tail to try and chase those flies away. It is a young male. I had to look. And the only way for me to tell was actually to try and look between the legs. Because it's only once they start getting to like a year and a half, two years old, when they start showing a bit of a mane. Jenna, you were asking what is the size of a male lion's paw when it's fully grown? Well, I would love to, to show you an example of it because, I mean, it's going to be easier for me to try and show you. I do have something here that I, that I could possibly use in order to show you. So I just want to page over to the back of this one book that I have. I do have the tracks of lions so if i go to this page right over here so this is how a lion track looks like so just to give you an idea at the back of this track you'll see there's one two three lobes and then one two three toes now this track of a lion is 12 centimeters of fully grown male so let me just show you in other words if i go to this size so 12 centimeters like that so if you would take my hand this lion's paw is probably the size of my hand. That's how our bigger lion's paw would be. It's hard to describe, but more or less you're looking at that size if I had to hold that paw in my hand. So often when lions are young, you can still see a little bit of pink on the nose. Now, if we look at this young white male lion right in front of us, You'll notice that the tip of the nose still has a bit of pink on it. And also, have you noticed around the neck, it looks like there's quite a bit of fluff. So that's the mane now starting to grow of this young male. And it'd only be at around about four and a half, five years where he'll start having quite a big mane. And only at six years will he have a fully grown male uh, mane like his dad. His dad is just laying in the grass at the back and I'm hoping that eventually he'll stand up and come and join them. But you can see very, very lazy animals. And sometimes, we, we spoke about it this morning, is they'll sleep up to 20 hours a day. That's quite a long time, just conserving as much energy as they possibly can. See, that mother just turned around. I would like to just look at her paw, because the sun is actually shining directly on her paw. So if you'd notice on the paw there, there you'll see these little black markings on it. I'm just trying to see if we can position to see it. 
Oh, she just tucked in a photo. If she shows it again, I'll, I'll, I'll point it out. But you can see the claws. See, there's these black markings. Oh, there we go. You might be able to see it. And um, so that's where the claws are tucked in, where those black markings are on, on her foot. Oh, she's just, she's almost using that little embankment as a, as a pillow, just to be comfortable. Also just chasing the flies now, and then you'll see her just flicking her tail, trying to get rid of those flies. Dove, you were asking a question, um, would the white lions be kicked out of the pride because they're white? Um, the answer is no, they, they won't be just, they won't be kicked out because they are part of this, this pride. However, what you will notice is this young male, whenever they, whenever he reaches an age around about two and a half, three years, that's when he'll be pushed out of the pride, not because he's white, but because mainly um, he starts to become more dominant. And if the other males start taking over this area, they do not want um, any other uh, males around because of the fact that they might mate with the female. So they'll try and push them out of the pride um, once they get to that stage. But if it's, let's say, if both of these white lines were both females, then they would have stayed with the pride as long as, as possible. And the pride um, would not just push them away. So while we're having a look to see what these lines might be up to, and if they do start moving, let's go across to James. I heard he's now currently looking um, at a particular water hole. I am looking at a water hole, yes. This water hole is the most disappointing water hole on all of Juma. It is potentially so picturesque for an animal to be here drinking epit large pride of lions, a squadron of wild dogs, even a giraffe or two. But almost universally, there is nothing here, except for the ever-faithful blacksmith lapwing. Have you seen any blacksmith lapwings, David? Ah, there's a woodland kingfisher. We can do him. The reason I'm here is that this, that big elephant headed off into a thick block and I'm pretty sure he's on his way here. Oh, that's quite, did you get that dog? That's very attractive. He's doing a little pirouette for us. Hmm. Now, Appet and beyond Dungala, the northern section is, oh, there's our knob duck. It's decided it doesn't like Treehouse Dam. Appet and beyond and Gala, the northern section is Mapani woodland. And in that Mapani woodland, there are a lot more natural tree cavities that you would find here because there's a fungus that grows, I think, almost exclusively on that tree that eats out the heartwood. And so the noise of the woodland kingfisher around the main camp at Angala is uh, it's, it's deafening. By the time they finally leave around about now, the, we just couldn't wait for them to go because 
there were so many nesting sites and therefore so many little territories that they used to try and defend. I don't hear our bull just yet. Let's give him five minutes. He may have stopped to sample some more delicious grass on his way. Oh, Aidan, that's a very difficult question to answer. My best sighting at a waterhole, let me think. I think my best sighting, oh, I can tell you, really nice. One of my greatest sightings was at this very waterhole, uh, when it wasn't quite such a disappointing spot. It hasn't always been. And we were on foot walking along here, and we tracked a lion down here, and we spotted the lion. Uh, she was just over there. And then we came up over the dam wall and we spotted the rest of the pride lying pretty much where the water ends. So that was very nice. That was exciting. And then two wild dogs came down towards this waterhole and we saw them on foot as well. And so it was a really special day. Were you on camera that day? No. It wasn't David on camera. So that was very cool. I've just found something quite interesting. just came floating by. Can you see this, David? No, it's just behind the chair. Yes, I know, I know, but now can you see it? This came floating by on the wind, on the breeze, and it is the seed of a three-orn grass. And you can see the three orns, those are the three things that make it look like a Mercedes sign. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And they are basically there to act like wings. And the seed is at the bottom here. Sorry, David, I hate to trouble you. The seed is at the bottom there. And this three-orn glass will, grass will float off. And eventually, if it's very lucky, make another three-orn grass plant, Aristida species. I'm going to give this elephant another three minutes and then move on. In the meantime, Trishala already has an animal. I do. And we're here up in the northeastern corner at Bifultuk Dam. And we have some hippos. We have five of them. And this is the tiniest one. Hello, tiny. Yes, you're very cute. Baby hippos are just adorable, as this one is giving you a very good example of just how adorable. And you can see the size difference there in the muzzle. Adults have quite a large head and a very long muzzle, males even more so. And this little one is just a miniature. Very sweet. This is lovely. So they usually will have a one Oh, I'm going to pull you away from the hippos for a second because I have an adorable jumping spider on my dashboard. And they are adorable. I cannot emphasize adorable. Um, oh, no, don't jump away. Come here. Come on. No, no, come jump into my hands. Jump into my hands. Do it. You can do it. They have the cutest eyes on the planet, everyone, on the planet. Come on. Okay, it's not obliging. Back to the hippos for you. Hippos also very cute. Oh, look at that. Oh, baby. That is just too cute. That is the best sighting I've had with the little ones. These little ones are often not and uh, don't do much at all. Very cute. I had a question about the species of hippo. Um, Louise will just give me that name again. 
Uzvoa, I think. Oh, very cute. Very cute. You'd like to know what species of hippo this? This is Hippopotamus amphibius. So you get pygmy hippos as well, but not in Africa. So this is a good old fashioned hippopotamus. That was a very, very sweet little calf. Hello, little calf. You're just adorable. Now, either it's very shallow there or it's standing on the back of one of the adults. They'll tend to do that. Because hippos don't swim. They walk across the bottom and then they propel themselves as they kick off from the bottom or the bed of the river or dam. <laughs> That's just lovely. <laughs> I know, it's just too cute. Those little ears as they flick along, it's just lovely. It's like I was saying before, they have usually one young at a time. It's just the way it goes with hippos, you can imagine. It's quite a large little one. Very talkative. Very, very talkative. <laughs> so, so cute. James, you'd like to know if they feel safe in the water? Did I get that one correctly? Louise was laughing at the same time, looking at just how, how cute this little one is being. Yes, okay, cool. Do they feel safe in the water? They definitely do. Imagine, you know, we speak about territories, cats have territories, etc. And that's are places that are basically exclusive. And that's the hippo's territory. This area, this water, water body is the hippo's territory. It's where they feel safest. It's their home. Not only that. Yes, very cute. It's also this, uh, a necessity to be in the water because of their fragile skin. Oh, it's being a little porpoise. Oh, very sweet. They have fragile skin that'll dry out very, very easily. There we go. Oh, it got photobombed by the adult. Their skin can, can get dry and cracked, which is why when they go out to, gre to graze and feed, it's usually in the evenings. In fact, they go out for about four to six hours in the night time. That's why it's very careful walking around the, uh, it's very dangerous and you need to be careful walking around the bush at night because your worst enemy is probably not going to be the three leopards that are on the property, but rather the hippos that are moving to and from their grazing areas that you will not know is around and can be at times quite aggressive, especially if you are in between their safe spot, as you said, James, the water, and, and they're grazing. But if you're standing in between, that's not a good place to be. Closer behind us. Thank you. Very cool. Right, little baby. Oh, hello, Tickney. That hello, little water thickney. It's a water thickney on the side there. Hello, Anna. You'd like to know just how fast a hippo can run on land? Actually, not. A, it's about 35 kilometers per hour or so. Definitely not faster than that. Um, to give you a, an idea. Um, People who run really, really, really fast, people who are sprinters, there you're looking at about 40 kilometers per hour, maybe even 45 kilometers per hour. I'm talking humans. But so when you think a hippo is out of the water and it's so round and large and they look clumsy that they're not going to be able to, to catch up with you. Well, if the fastest sprinters are going at about 45 kilometers per hour, a hippo is going at 30, 35 kilometers per hour on land. 
which is pretty fast and it's actually gonna gonna catch you very easily I know I can't run at 35 kilometers per hour um, not that I've tried but I'm quite sure that I can't so a hippo can easily get me in fact lots of animals can run around the same um, speed that we can so you've got to be careful you definitely do very very cute okay well it's starting to be a little bit cooler now and the sun is starting to get softer so we're gonna head down to the hyena den and see how Ruben is doing I hope you all remember her and while we keep on doing that we're gonna send you back over to Nikki at and beyond Zingala with those lovely lions so you'll see that these lions have moved quite a bit from where they were earlier or just a few of them have moved you'll see this one female has just moved quite close towards us now and constantly she's snapping at these flies like flicking her tail rubbing her eyes and even the one at the back so i don't think it will be too long um, before they eventually get a little bit more restless and start moving you'll even notice with the pride earlier on there was barely any movement i could actually hear land snoring um like 20 25 minutes ago but now more and more of them are starting to move around even the grass off to the right um, a few have already started rolling around so i'm hoping in the next 15 20 minutes they'll get up and start moving Michaela, you were asking where is the breakaway pride's territory if this is the burning of pride. So we are currently in the central part of um, and beyond Ngala. And the breakaway pride is more towards our west. Now, I would like to use the map again because I think this would probably be the best just to, to show you where the pride will be. Now, I want to also show you where we are now with these lines. So if we just quickly look at this map over here. So we are probably around there. Now the burning and pride covers this whole section like this. So this whole like section here and a section of the eastern side. So this is north, this is south, this is east and this is west. And the breakaway pride will probably their territory probably starts from here and it stretches all the way um, west into the Timbavati. But more or less, this will be the burning of pride and then um, on this side, the breakaway pride. Frog with teeth, you are asking a very good question. Do we smell like bacon <laughs> to the lions? Um, I think after the warm day, most likely we'll probably smell like bacon towards them. But I don't, I honestly don't think so. I think probably the smell that they get from us is a very strong smell because you can imagine how well developed their senses are. But I don't think exactly like bacon. Um, I think people have quite a unique smell that it's really hard to describe. But Yeah, I was just trying to, I was just trying to think like while I'm sitting here, what would the smell be of, of people towards lions? And it's, it's so hard to describe. I think maybe like a combination of, of quite a few different smells, maybe the smell of diesel from the vehicles, maybe a smell of Mar a bit of Marcel's cologne, um, maybe even the elephant dung that I'm driving with in my vehicle, but there's quite a variety of different smells that are blowing towards them. One just got up, nice little stretch, and just moving. It looks like there is another line laying down 
um, just on the right of where that one is moving. So, well, heads down. You can see this female also just picked up a head right in front of us. She's so elegant, like the way she's laying down. I'd, I'd like to really focus on her, and you'll see how she's actually used her left paw to rest her chin on it, and then her right paw is tucked underneath as a little bit of support. And it's our now and then just trying to, like a half-hearted attempt to try and get rid of those flies. Emma, 10 years old, you were asking, how do we get around these lions if we are, if we needed to get back to the lodge and we're really late? Now, I would suggest we are very lucky that with most of the vehicles that we are driving, it is um, these 4x4s. Four four. So rather than disturbing them and chasing them off the road, we'll probably wait a little bit to see if they move off. If not, we'll just try and, and move next to the road and drive around them but we, we won't try and drive through them um, and disturb them you'll notice that the just behind this white young male there's quite a few other um, brown color lions And just above the other ones is that young white female laying down. But for now, we're still waiting to see if they might move. Let's see what James is up to. I was thinking, trying to think of something pithy to say, but I couldn't. So we've just stopped here at this tropical tent where the spiders nest. David, allow me to alight from the vehicle. And in so doing, point at it at the features of this nest. So what is interesting about this particular spiada, uh, the log's moving because I'm standing on the other end of it, is that it is part of the Iranidae. In other words, it is an orbweb spider, but it's not an orbweb spider. So it's in the orbweb spider uh, family. Sorry, excuse me, one second. Sorry, David. The game drive radio is talking absolute garbage as per usual. And so it is an orb web spider, but it's developed a different kind of a web. And it makes the, a net underneath. It's a little bit like a circus net. And what happens is an unsuspecting fly comes buzzing along here, minding its own business, trying to find some sort of carcass to go and feed upon. And it flies into one of these knockdown threads, whereupon it panics and tries to fly out. But the further it falls down towards the net, the more and more knockdown threads there are, and the more and more entangled it gets until it falls down into the extremely fine netting that is at the very bottom of this tropical tent web spider's nest. And then it's tickets. And what's interesting is that all of the silk here is apparently the same, so that is different from most of the orb web spiders. Most of the orb webs we'll make uh, support strands and the uh, the sort of circular strands, which have a name which escapes me, of a different kind of silk, whereas this particular spider makes the whole thing out of the same silk. Isn't that a fascinating fact? Yes, it is. And these three things here are, of course, the... Oh, there's another one who thinks this looks like a snowman. Kirsten thinks... Kirsten is in final control. She thinks that this looks like a snowman with its head chopped off. It is, of course, the egg sacs, the three egg sacs. And somebody else said that two days, three days ago, that the egg sacs look like a snowman. I suppose they do. I don't know where the actual owner of the web is, though. She seems to have absconded and is probably sitting on a leaf, hoping that we'll go away and leave her alone, which we shall. My dear, you may come out. We shall leave you. Thank you for placing your web in such an easily accessible and viewable spot. That 
sound you can hear in the background is a golden deer, a golden-tailed woodpecker. Ian, you're asking if there are any tiger mosquitoes in South Africa. I've never heard of a tiger mosquito, so possibly, but I, I don't know. Sounds like a particularly terrifying kind of mosquito. <laughs> so I don't really know. Ah, the Asian tiger mosquito, which is found in Southeast Asia. No, I don't think we do, Ian. I've never been set upon by a mosquito that looks or feels like a tiger, or sounds like a tiger. Yes, Marshall, this is, ju this is not my real accent. Uh, this one is just for the bush. I'll do my normal accent for you now. This is the way I normally speak. We normally just drive along and I speak like this. I'm from uh, part of South Africa where this is where they speak like, and so this is how I speak normally. But it's not obviously easy to understand, and so uh, I don't speak like this when I'm on a camera. I speak in a bit of a different way when I'm on a camera, and it's a bit easier for people to understand. So, yeah. I bet there's some people who probably think that really is how I speak when I'm not on camera. No, this is the real way I speak. Is it? Is there something wrong with it? You're the second person to ask that in the last few days. I, I mean, I think I'm relatively easy to understand, aren't I? Is there something wrong with my accent? Should I be trying to change it? Louise says it's because I'm so much fancier than the rest of rest of us. I don't think I'm fancier at all. I'm just speaking a very neutral accent, don't I? I think I do. Yes, do a poll, Louise. Do a poll. Louise is going to do a Twitter poll about my accent on account of the fact that I cannot find a leopard and therefore we will have to talk about my accent. Uh, you can find it on Twitter. The poll is as follows. The poll is... I don't, I, Louise, I don't know that that's fair. <laughs> the, the poll is... Does James speak with a neutral accent or a posh accent? Well, there's the poll. You'll find it at hashtag Wild Earth. You can vote. I know what's going to happen with this. Shala, I'm sure, is making her way slowly down towards the hyena den, very slowly, but on her way she's found a rodent. I have, I found a lovely tree squirrel. As you can see, that's probably as freaked out by me <laughs> as it normally is by seeing a leopard. Or, as I discovered today, so just to give you some context, You are, it's down the bottom, Owen. On that log now, on the ground. Oh, you've got a flower in your mouth. Oh, you've got one of those wild cucumbers in your mouth. Oh, very nice. So, squirrel's alarm call. Um, and that can give you an indication that there is a, a predator around. But I have noticed, well, I mean, they're notoriously unreliable. And I have noticed that today, next door, a vehicle turned its engine on and then it started to alarm at the car. So even though I suspected that they were unreliable, I now know 100% that they are unreliable. I want to show you a beautiful view 
let's just get to a slightly more open space. Now we're, in, oh, we're on a road that's called a Drakensberg Road. And that's because you get a view of the mountains. There we go. Just gorgeous. This is, an, this is an extension of the Drakensberg Mountains that come all the way up here. We are in the northeastern corner, almost, or section of South Africa here at Joomla Game Reserve. And this is the stunning view that we are blessed with every day. Unless it's raining, of course. Get those beautiful crepuscular rays coming through. The sun starting to really ease up. And that's very exciting because that means that this is the time that predators that are down in the grass and would have been lying up for most of the day when it's too hot will now start to make a move. Which is very exciting for us because it means the potential to find these predators is just that much higher. In fact, it was a time of day just like this when I had Flalamba. Oh, princess here at Juma, she's a leopardess. Catch a Nyala right in front of us. As we were alive, it was gorgeous. It was a day just like this. Stunning. Don't you think it's an aptly named road? I think so. But speaking of predators starting to get up and move, I'm sure that Nikki's lions are thinking about it, though they're not moving just yet. So these lions haven't moved at all. They just only been twitching and turning and snapping at one or two flies. And then the one got up, moved to the right and then got back again. And the one female that was just laying on the side, she's just gone and laid down, but it is cooling down quite a bit now. Like I, I heard early on that Trishala was showing you the clouds and the um, Drakensberg in the distance. Now at the moment, it is slowly starting to cool down. And what I'm hoping for is with lions, as soon as it starts cooling them down, that's when they'll start uh, moving. The wind is blowing um, almost from where the, where the lines are towards us in this direction. So I'm sure that if they do start getting up, they'll probably start heading down in that direction. It's also an area where the water hole is. You can imagine now that this morning they made some, a kill on a small kudu. Um, and they haven't been to any water as well as at how hot it's been. So eventually... I'm thinking that they'll probably go visit a water hole or maybe even a little pan system where they can go and drink. It's just so peaceful at the moment. You can sit here and you'll just hear the wind like blowing like over us. Yehuda, age 12, Johannesburg, you were asking why won't the lions go and hunt right now? Now, I think, like, knowing this pride is they... So some of the, the members of this pride is very experienced in hunting. And so what they'll do is they'll probably wait for it to get a little bit darker. Um, and then they'll start moving th from there. The reason being is because lions are surprise predators. So what they do is they move... Um, and the time of the day when they prey can't see as well as they can and then they'll split up from there and um, Try and get close enough before the or, uh, before they can actually start the hunt So I'm thinking for them. They are they just resting up until it slowly starts um, To get darker and as soon as it starts getting darker and a bit cooler That's when they'll start moving also in the heat of the day for them It's not really necessarily moving a lot because then um, they're burning quite a lot of energy So they want to conserve as much as they can they want to save that so as soon as they're ready, they can start moving. So Jenna Fulcher was asking a very interesting question. What was the closest encounter that I've ever had with a lion? Now... It was actually a few days ago. 
So myself and one of the other rangers were walking not too far away from here, and we were actually tracking um, these lines right over here. And as we were tracking, the grass was really tall, and we were trying to see if we can spot any tracks. And normally when we track, we two people. Um, one will carry a rifle, and then, of course, the other person will look out for tracks. And so we were walking on this game trail. So a game trail is like a a path where animals move back and forth either to water or away from water and as we were like walking in this particular area it started getting denser and denser and denser and we said all right you know what because the lines are have moved into this area, it's really thick so we don't want to surprise them let's turn around and as we turned around we were walking back to the vehicle and then as we cross this one particular drainage line so a drainage line is an area where water drains off and it's also quite dense it's almost as dense as this area where the lions are sleeping in now and i didn't have the rifle with me i just picked up a little walking stick to to have a look at some tracks as we were walking and all of a sudden one of these lionesses picked up that i actually think it was this one that's laying down off to the left here this big one off to the side her and she stood up in the grass right in front of me maybe 15 meters away so immediately, like, I decided, all right, we need, I need to move out just to, to get a bit of distance between her and I. And the most important thing here is you can't run. Because if you run, then, like, they might associate you with prey because you're running away. So you can't run, but you have to slowly move away from them. And as I was moving back, the big male lion, like, lifted his head in the grass right next to me as well. And at that moment, I can just hear him, like, snarling at us like a... And immediately Yopi like said to me, like, let's get out. And he, and he guided me and we moved slowly back away from these lines. But it was a really, really close um, call because we were so close to them. And it wasn't that we were actively going to go and, and look for them. It's just as we turned around, they were right there. Um, but I would say that was one of the close encounters I had recently. There were some other lion stories, um, but hopefully like, I'll be able to share some more of them um, as we go along. So these lines still haven't moved, still wanting to see if they are going to move this afternoon. But for now, James has found some giraffe. Let's head across to him. We found a great collection of bull giraffe. Four bull giraffe over here and one bull giraffe over to the right-hand side of the road, which we cannot look at because, unfortunately, that's on another reserve, and so we can't look into it. Um, talking garbage, of course, we can look into it, we just can't drive into it. Well, we've got a nice big journey of giraffe here, and here comes the other bull giraffe there, David. It's in the next door reserve, but soon it will be on ours. Whew, that's called visual trespassing. Don't you feel naughty? So rather like with the elephants, these giraffes tend to come in some profusion and then just disappear. We don't really know why. So this is quite an interesting little gathering of bachelors. And what I find quite, well, I mean, comforting, I suppose, in some sense, is that this is basically how all male mammals, as I said this morning, operate before they're able to become dominant breathing males and, you know, they sort of lose their affection for one another, they live in these small bachelor groups. So all the antelope do it, elephants do it, zebras do it, giraffes do it, even educated fleas do it. No, no, that's a different song. Oh, good. Seventy-four percent of you think that I sound posh, and twenty-four percent of you think I sound neutral. Thank you to the twenty-four, to the seventy-six percent, a pox upon you this evening.
Uh, no, Elias. A group of giraffes don't have an alpha at all. There's no sort of leadership here. Basically, what happens is the bigger the giraffe is, the more dominant he's going to be. So if a mating opportunity occurs, so should this gang of five strapping young gentlemen come across a herd of females, one of whom is in estrus, it's simply the biggest guy who will dominate. That tends to be, interestingly, how it goes in just about all mammals until you get to the primates, when politics, and I do mean politics, starts to play a fairly major role. So in chimpanzees, you will find that it's not always the biggest male who is the alpha. He can be quite a lot smaller than some of the others. It happens in baboons from time to time as well. And obviously, we've seen it happen in human beings. So despite the obvious size or advantages that a chimpanzee with size has, he can be outmaneuvered politically to a position of power. And of course, our species is the ultimate example of that, where, yes, it certainly helps to be tall if you want to dominate, but it's not the only way to dominate. But in most species, like lions, elephants, giraffe, pretty much all the antelope. I can't think of another example actually outside of the primates where a less than largest individual can become alpha. Well, Louise is now asking about hyenas. Well, in the females, which dominate there, it is normally the biggest female. But I suppose, Lou, you're probably correct in that there could be some exceptions where hyenas often have a slightly fatalistic uh, idea of their position. So even if they're born to low rank and perhaps they don't have the same amount of that androstenedione, which gives them the male sexual characteristics, Perhaps even if they do get big, they, you know, they don't ever try to dominate and try to work their way up the hierarchy. But I think it would be very unusual for a small hyena, a small female hyena, to manage to dominate the hierarchy or matriarchy in a hyena clan. Right, Trishala has managed to find more elephants, so let's go and find out what they're doing. These elephants are trying to get this female that's near me, so I'm going to keep it very safe here. But I want you to be with me while this happens. Now, look how massive this bull is. Now, I'm hoping that he's going to move off the road. Yes. Okay, there we have a female is moving swiftly past us. Keep on going, girl. Keep on going. I'm just going to be quiet, okay? Hey, hey, hey! Ah, uh ah! -uh. So they're trying to mate with this female. And there's two of them chasing her. So you've got to be a little bit firmer. Here's this massive bull in front of us. is humongous. He's going to be coming past your screen now. So there's been lots of screaming going on. There are actually three bulls chasing her. There's another one on the road in front of me. So this whole scenario means that I can't move very much. Because what I will end up doing is is bringing their attention to the fact that I'm in the vehicle and especially the rumblings of turning on the vehicle can can disturb them but it seems good now they've moved into the drainage let's move a little further ahead so you can see the back of that male at those times it literally comes down to a bit of a battle of 
you know, standing your ground. That was a very close for me, as in close as in I didn't feel totally safe. And it's important to feel that way with elephants. But I also wanted you to be with me so that you could see exactly what I mean. There's a difference between an elephant that's trying to display to you, who's telling you, hey, don't come and bother me, and an elephant who is who is not thinking about that at all and is coming for you. Um, and in that case, that male that came right close to the car, did you see him? He was not interested in me, but I am in the way, simply because I'm parked here, because I can't move and can't turn on, because they were hurling themselves this way. So if I had turned on and tried to move at that point, I would have just instigated them. So I'm going to be very careful, as I, especially when you take turns. Um, I'm sorry I had to shout at it, but uh, in that moment, you kind of have to do what you have to do. All right, they're still screaming. They're pursuing her. But uh, we're going to head to the den because it's not exactly a safe situation. So we'll send you over back to Nikki at Ambion's in Gala with his sleepy lions. I really hope for his sake they get up pretty soon. So these lions haven't moved at all now. Like the last time they were moving quite a bit because of the flies. But it seems to me they have settled and they've gone for that, that second like sleep. Um, but what we're hoping for is as we said earlier, as soon as it cools down, maybe we'll see a bit more movement. I have noticed this one female um, that is, you'll see her now, she's just off here to the left. Early on she was laying on her belly, but look at her now. She's just turned around and she's laying on her back, very comfortable with her legs open, even her tail to support her. But, and then her head laying on the side there, there's like a little bank that she's resting her head on. But very, very comfortable. So let's quickly go back to church. Apparently there's some elephants chasing one another. Let's quickly go have a look. It is very interesting indeed. Now elephants literally sprinted across me in front of me. And it was a, a female with a very young calf pursued by a must bull. And that happens often, even though he knows he can't mate with her. Well, actually he doesn't know that. The point is that he's sort of a little bit intoxicated i'm hoping i'll be able to get you a view and what ends up happening is he mistakes this the hormones that she's secreting because of um, because of the fact that she's recently given birth she, he mistakes that as a female in estrus and he starts pursuing her and that's how many calves actually get hurt okay okay i see something Huge bull. You can just see the tops of it. Can you see it? They own. Oh my goodness! I think they. I think he's mating with her. Let's just let's just wait. It's very tall. Yes, yes, they mated. Oh my goodness. Did you see how the, he the height went back to normal as he went down? Guys, it's very rare to see mating elephants. The little calf is, little, is nearby as well. So what she would have done is let, let him mount her for the sake of the protection of little calf. And not being harassed. Wow. Okay, let's turn around. Let's turn around. Okay, I'm turning I'm turning it around because there's some screaming going on behind me. Luckily, we're in a better position now to be able to view all of this safely. See 
if we get a view. Running, running, running. Okay, out of the way, out of the way. Okay, we're gonna wait here. Okay, she's gonna come past again. We're gonna be quiet, okay? tail is sticking out. They're, they're stressed. They've got adrenaline pumping. They've got that fluid that drips over from mast bulls, from the temporal glands, flowing through them, coursing through them, creating excitement. Whew. Okay, well I'm glad you could have uh, been with me for that. We're all safe now. <laughs> oh, I can still hear screaming. Listen. to move while I'm not because this animal is close. I need to move. Standing by James. Okay. I am going to send you back to Nikki and Beyond Zingala with those lines and I'm gonna suss out what's happening here. James, I think go for it if you are closer. I've been stuck. Just have a look at how this <laughs> one lion is laying with his left paw on top of this young white male. And then this female just right of him, how uh, he she's also like laying with her paws on top of his belly. Very, very comfortable. Alistair, you were asking if the lion has ever chased my vehicle, so touch wood, no, it, it has never chased my vehicle. Um, however, I do remember the one time we were watching a herd of zebra, and these lions started chasing the zebra, but the zebra ran around the vehicle, and at that moment, the lion ran straight at the vehicle, and I... I, I thought at that moment the lion's probably going to jump into the vehicle to try and get to the zebra and probably five six meters away from the vehicle it veered off and ran in front of the vehicle past um towards the zebra but by that time the zebra were already long gone but it was quite a, a terrifying experience because i didn't know like what would i have done if this lion like got into the vehicle Braley, age 11, you've asked me if I've ever seen a lion fighting each other. Now, I have, and with this pride, let me quickly, I just wanted to point out, see where the young male is laying down, that white male with the other one's paw on it. So just right of him, there's one laying down with his head facing away from us. So you see neck, on the back of his neck, there's a bit of, like, a mane starting to grow. So that is a young male. Now, I've seen one of the bigger males fighting with that young male and then the rest of the pride actually intervened and, and and pulled that big male off of that little one or that younger one 
and he was very submissive after that. As soon as the male came close, he just went and he laid down, showing that he is submissive. But I have seen it quite a few times. But now recently, I saw it with that particular uh, male lion, that youngster. Asha, you were that on, Asha, nine years old. You were asking a very good question of how long would lions go without food? Now, normally a lion will probably be able to go like a week and a half, maybe two weeks. Like that's pushing it to the, the absolute boundary um, for them. But if they can, in order to hunt, they'll try and hunt at least every third, fourth day. If they can, every day they'll, they'll do it because they're very opportunistic. They just never know when the next meal is going to be. They'll take any opportunity they can. But as soon as it goes past two weeks, then they're so deteriorated that they might not be able to, to hunt properly. Um, and eventually they'll, they'll die of starvation from there. But hopefully, and also knowing this pride, they are very good hunters in this, uh, in this pride. And so... I've never seen them going more than a week um, without having something to eat, even if it's something small. Look at that one just putting his feet close to that young male's face. Oh! It's amazing how when, when lions come together, how social they are and how close they can be together. Like often you find if there's a, quite a few youngsters around, they tend to want to lay on top of mom and then mom gets irritated quite quickly and she'll just like move off and then move further away and lay down. And I wonder if this is not the reason why this other one um, walked further away and then laid down by herself. Because you can see all the youngsters are pretty close together. And of course that young male, look at how he's picked up his leg now. He's just laying behind that white male line. So often, like a nice indication, if you were sitting with a pride of lions, if you wanted to know are they going to be moving pretty soon or not, is to look and see if they are yawning. Now often if they start rolling around and they start yawning constantly, it's a good sign that they are. They've well rested and they're now ready to start moving. Um, but for now, you can, you'll can you notice that like none of them are really rolling around or yawning. So it might still be a little while before they could potentially start moving. Terence, you were asking what are the main lion collisions within this area. So the two dominant males that are currently with this pride, they refer to as the Ross males. So they are currently the dominant males or the dominant collision of this area. So before them, there used to be a collision of three male lions. But eventually, like because of age, they passed away and these two males took over. And we do see also, like up on the northern side of the reserve, there are other males that are slowly creeping into territory. I don't know too much about them, and we'll probably find out a bit more, um, especially if this pride starts moving a bit more south, we might find them coming in, like, into the reserve a bit more, and we'll be able to see it. But currently on this reserve, the two dominant coalition would be these Ross males that are currently with the pride. Logan, 13 years old, you were asking if lions keep the same mate um, 
for their whole life, and unfortunately not. So what will happen is, so the dominant males here will mate with the females. But as soon as they are get pushed out of this area by other dominant males um, that might take over this pride, they will then mate with the females. So the females won't necessarily go with those other males and follow them. Um, so they do not have partners. They don't stick together for life. I want to try and see, we can't see that big male as of yet, but I'm trying to see if we can maybe reposition our vehicle in such a way and see if we can get a glimpse of that, that big male. He's just laying, you see the lion furthest at the back with her chin up in the air? So he's just laying in the grass on the left there. So we're going to try and reposition um, our vehicle. Let's get back to Trishala. She's heading down to the Ahina Den. I finally made it after many an elephant roadblock. We finally made it to the hyena den, and I can say that ribbon girl here is looking a bit better than the last few times I've been here, and she's been stiff and painful. She gave herself a nice stretch, so she is looking like she's recovering very well. Yes, you are, my gorgeous girl. Absolutely beautiful. So, of course, you know what we're here for. We're hoping to see the cubs get out and about. Hyena cubs are very, 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 very playful. I've had them do all sorts of things while we're in the vehicle. Where our footrest is for the pedals, they come and try to nibble our shoes while we turn around and talk to you through the camera. And I'm sure that these little ones will be no different. Now we're hoping to see two little cubs. And we know that at least one is in there. So yesterday with James, we saw one. Then we didn't see it, and then we saw another. So it could be the same one. Or there could be two that are just coming out at separate times. Either way, we're very excited to see them. Hello Charlotte, what an amazing question for a girl who's only eight years old. It's so nice to hear from you. You say it looks so green and lush all around you. Have we had a lot of rain? We did have an amazing rainy season this year. Our rainy season is our spring and summer, which is basically September um, to Feb. We had a lot of rain think past our normal amount. Normally per year we should get between 400 and 600 millimeter, uh, milliliters and we think I think we surpassed that so we got even more than that Charlotte and so it's been very very good. Now remember the dam that we went to earlier the one that had the baby hippo in it that very cute little hippo that dam only a couple months ago just was a flat surface. It almost looked like a crater had hit that surface. It was just a depression with a little bit of mud in the middle. And now it's a complete full dam. So we have had a great amount of rain, Charlotte. Thank you for noticing. On behalf of the bush, we'd like to thank you for noticing just how good we're looking at the moment. Ribbon is getting irritated by some flies. She wouldn't be the first one out here. She's got a few extra um, nicks, etc. on her ears, which are what those flies are, are sitting on. Blood is a good source of nutrients. It means that the fats, proteins, and other minerals are very easily available in blood. So that's why many insects and animals, if they can get a hold of it, will, even if it's not their typical meal. Now my favorite bit about being at the den is the possibility of those little ones coming out. Now within a couple months, they'll start to get spots and even before that they will be very, 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 very curious and I can't wait to share that experience with you because it is unbelievable just how much fun they have.
much, you doll. Hello. Ooh, you'd like to know if these biting flies are just common flies? It's hard to tell from here. Flies are numerous, numerous, but they're likely to be biting flies because biting flies enjoy a bit of blood. But there are many, 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 many flies. In fact, um, it's often quoted that beetles, that are the order that beetles are, are Coleoptera, is the most species. That means it has the is most biodiverse in terms of species of all insects. But in flies, in fact, <laughs> in flies, in fact, recent research has shown that perhaps Diptera, which includes flies, is the most most species. Of course, that's hard to do because we only know of just a little fragment of the insects that are around, and many, many are yet to be discovered or differentiated. Sometimes we see insects and we don't realize that they are, even though they look similar or even the same, some genetic differences set them apart. But it's likely to be a type of fly that enjoys a bit of blood. Mix, you'd like to know when will Ribbon introduce her cubs to the rest of the clan? There's not really a day that Ribbon will do that or a time that Ribbon will do that. All that needs to be done is that Ribbon will need to make sure that her cubs are safe in the den for as long as possible. And other members of the clan that come around to the den will not be excluded from seeing the cubs. If the cubs are out and other members come, the cubs will see them, the other members will see the cubs, and especially because she's a high-ranking member, she's the matriarch, her cubs in inherit her ranking, regardless of their sex, which is interesting because we know that males are lower ranked than, um, than females, but cubs outrank males. So they, other members will come and will be very respectful of her cubs, in fact, I remember with Plonk, Corky, our past matriarch, and her cub. Corky used to prance around, um, sorry, Plonk used to prance around when he was a little thing, just starting to get spots, and um, going about and greeting all the members of the clan that would come along. So she doesn't introduce them. There's no fear that they will be um, somehow... Um, aggressiveness from the rest of the clan. She and her position puts her in a nice space of comfort. So others will come along and there will be no problem to the cubs. Occasionally you may get the you know, rogue individual that may, may want to hurt the cubs, but those type of things are quickly nipped in the bud. Anyway, I showed you a beautiful sunset earlier. Now the sun has set even more and more beautifully and James has it. Let's go to him. That's a bit disappointing to hear. I thought that I was going to show you your first view of the mountains today and the sun, which was recently set in the west, but it turns out that I'm a mere copycat. How sad. Still, it is very pleasant to see that cloud ringed as it is, not in silver, but in ruby grapefruit shininess. most peaceful time, this second most peaceful time of the day, for me the most peaceful is dawn, but many people do love this time of the day. The cricket's starting to come alive. Oh, great. <laughs> Sorry everyone, I'm going to have to move out of the way. vehicle coming up behind us at about 350 kilometers an hour. Anyway, I shall try and maintain my peace, full visage and attitude. There's a vehicle full of the world's unfriendliest people. So in no rush to watch the sunset. 
Right, the Birmingham Pride is up. Let's go and see where they're going. I'll continue and see if I can find something else. So the pride just started getting up and they've we've actually heard some lions roaring in the distance and as soon as they started roaring all of these got up look at the little um white female that just got up she's now following the rest you can see she is pretty skinny so they'll probably start looking for a hunting opportunity this evening The other one's joining, and there's one female just behind them, one of the bigger adults. And also, if I look at her belly, she hasn't, probably even with this morning's kill, she hasn't had anything to eat. And of course, it'd be interesting to see how far this young male will trail behind the rest of the pride. Because remember, that other big male was leading this pride. So I would wonder, like, like to see how far he'll be trailing behind. As soon as they move past, we'll turn around because they are currently moving behind us. Just give it some time. Here we go. One big yawn. Nice little stretch. And now ready to go. Another yawn. just having a look you'll see the way that he's staring with his head held down it's not because of the vehicle here it's actually the male is just behind us at the moment one of the bigger males and he's looking at him so this behavior is probably just him showing that he is submissive Sorry about that, guys, but we still are here. I'm sure Ngala will be back momentarily. At least we hope so. But for now, Ribbon is still poised perfectly. And we haven't seen anything yet. So I'm hoping that while you're here, that will be the moment that these little ones will come peek out their little heads. So let's talk about them for a little bit. Oh, there's a lot of littles in that sentence. Being a two or at least we hope that they are still too. There can be a lot of competition even from the time they're this young. Already within the den there would have been many, many fights. In fact, there could have even been fights to the death. Apart from that, they'll assert their dominance and there will be one clear dominant individual from the very beginning. After a couple days of getting to know each other and fighting, one will be noticeably larger than the other because they prioritize nipple space. Hey girl, it's just me. And nipple space is, obviously they have two nipples so they can feed two individuals, but it's a priority for where they feed from. So the dominant individual will lie against mom's tummy 
with the head pointing towards the rear and suckle. And then the subordinate individual will actually suckle between the hind legs and they will eye each other while they suckle and that subordinate one will be fully aware that at any point the dominant individual this will decide hey I don't want you here and will actually growl at chase the other individual out at which point the smaller one subordinate one will try to get some sympathy from mum but that doesn't go down well she will give nothing where are you off to? oh no ribbon I'm just gonna watch where she goes and you can have a look at the stunning moon it's super moon day today actually oh there she's going off alright if she just going to watch as she goes but as she moves out of my sight I too have to move gorgeous gorgeous supermoon supermoon just simply means that the actual orbit of the moon lies slightly closer today than it does on other days but it is stunning stunning Okay, Ribbon has moved away from the den, which means for us that we have to move away too. We can chat about why when you come back to me, but I was right. My prediction was correct. We have and Bjorn Zingala back, and Nikki is still with those lines, so let's go over to him. So, just having a look, you'll see the, like, right in front of us is that young male laying down, and just in front of him is the bigger, more dominant male. And what he's doing is he is definitely keeping this one on the outskirts. And the reason why he's doing it, oh, look, look, he might just start marking his territory. Often when males start rubbing their heads against the trees, you'll see them turning around, picking up their tail, and then spraying urine into the bush. Let's see if he does that. See, so turn around, picks up his tail, and now he's just sent marking. So he's telling all the other males that this is my territory, and he doesn't want them, anyone here. Especially this young male, look at that. He doesn't tolerate him at all. Be interesting to see what's going to happen with this young male if he gets any bit closer to this pride. You can see he's slowly creeping forward. I think let's slowly like this move forward. Look at the way that he's moving. want to move slightly closer now this male was moving the bigger male was moving closer to this youngster that young <laughs> sub adult and he started moving off from there see oh look the whole pride in the middle of the road And that's the whole thing, like with the pride of lions, you just never know what's going to happen. And it's also full moon. Um, once we get to a better angle, we'll show everyone the moon. But this is absolutely amazing. And the way that they are moving is slightly into the wind as well. So they might be looking out for an opportunity to hunt this evening. Right. Let's follow them for a little while. You'll notice at the very back. That w young white male has just joined up with his father. Now and then he'll go rub up against his dad and then carry on.
Jesse, we're asking if I've ever seen a lion fighting with any other animal other than a lion. Like I have seen lions fighting with leopards before. Um, and also some of the other predators, like I have seen them fighting with hyenas as well. But more often when lions do, when it's a quite a big fight, is when two male lions fight um, with one another. Have a look at that big male again. He's slightly turning, lifting up his tail and scent marking. Now what's quite interesting is I'm not seeing the other big male with them at the moment. So the other brother of the Strauss male. I can only see the young um, sub-adult male as well as this bigger male off to the right. Dale, you were asking a good question about will the older male eventually accept that younger male into the coalition? Now, as it stands, it could sometimes happen that an older male would accept the young male. But as it stands, these bigger males are pushing this, young, this younger male away. And as soon as he starts showing any form of dominance, they'll actually fight. So as it stands, I don't think they'll, they'll join up with this coalition. He'll eventually... Um, be pushed out by these males and, and have to wander by himself. A while, like I think it was a week ago, they actually pushed him off and he was away from the pride for maybe a, like five or six days and eventually he came back um, yesterday to the pride as well as these bigger males. So whenever the big males aren't there, he is still allowed to join up with the pride but once they start moving and they don't really want to tolerate him and they don't have too much patience for him, as we're talking, this one big male is literally walking behind us. He's just behind me now, marking his territory. So I'm just gonna sit still and you'll have a look. You might even hear him. I'm gonna try and position the mic so you can hear him. Just gonna lean out of the way, see if I can have a look at the smell. Oh, how big is he? Just look at the size of those paws. It'd be interesting to see how he's gonna tolerate this other subadult when he gets closer. You can see right in the middle of the road in front is the big male, him here at the back, and then that young subadult <coughs> just off to the left. Shall we see if we can get a closer glimpse? I just want to position to see um, this young male right in front of us here. Even though he's still so young, did everyone notice the size of his teeth? It's probably the size of, of one's thumb, like if you measure it from the digit all the way to the tip. Like maybe in terms of, of centimeter-wise, like two and a half centimeters, pretty big. And it's the last thing that I want to, <laughs> that I ever want to encounter, those big teeth. Yaku, you were asking a very interesting question about are hyena teeth stronger than that of a lion? To be completely honest with you, I'm not too sure. Um, I know hyenas have a very strong bite force, 
but I'm not too sure in terms of the teeth densities which one would be the strongest. I mean, maybe one of our viewers have has read anything or maybe something interesting about it or even like might have done a study or something in that line. I would really like to know if anyone knows a bit more about it. So with these lines, because their youngsters are around at the moment, we don't want to spotlight them um, at all because that makes them quite vulnerable, especially if there could be other predators around. Um, and as well as it's one of the things we really want to try and be as sensitive as we possibly can be to the prize. So there is another road that's not too far away from here. And what I'm thinking is these lines might be heading down towards this other road, which is in the direction of the water hole. So maybe what we can do is go across and go and stop at that water hole and see if these lines come down to drink some water. But for now, you can see this one is just staying on the outskirt. The other ones are probably heading down that direction. Just, just follow them for a little while to see if the other ones are maybe not just moved off the road. Um, but if they do keep on going in that direction, off to the right of the road, they might be heading down to the water. Let's, for now, while we're going to go loop around, let's head across to James. We have got what's known as an ossicone silhouette here. The giraffe has walked into a thicket, tripped over five or six logs, sounded like an elephant and is now standing, looking ashamed towards the west. He was standing so beautifully silhouetted against the sky, and then he decided to walk into that thicket. Either there is an elephant there, or this giraffe's got himself rather nastily snagged. No, I think there is an elephant. Are we still in colour, David? Aye. Aye. Now, what I desperately wanted you all to hear is the last call of the white-browed scrub robin, which always fills me with a deep sense of peace. But because it is not calling, I shall do the call for you. Are you ready? starting up. Could the fork deliver us? That's what the firing net night jar says. We'll see him at all. He's done. He's done. Right, let's just sneak around the corner here. See if there's perhaps another shot of him. Confirm or deny the presence of an elephant. Peter, age 12, what a great question and uh, an appropriate time of your life for you to be asking it. You say, do animals go through puberty? Absolutely they do, Peter. Uh, pretty much the same way that we do as human beings. So this, let's take this giraffe, for example, 
when he was probably around about five years old, he would have experienced very much many of the same changes that human beings experience in different ways. So there's an increased production of testosterone, which creates the um, formation of secondary sexual characteristics. So similarities between that giraffe and human beings would be an increase in mass, a growth, growth spurt, um, a much thicker neck, uh, bigger chest muscles uh, that the females wouldn't get. Uh, he doesn't get any hairier like you're going to get, unfortunately, for you. Uh, well, maybe fortunately, maybe not. You might end up like me, in which case you'll have no hair on your head and lots of it on your back. And I don't hope that for you. I hope that, that doesn't happen for you. <laughs> but yeah, all animals, all the mammals go through puberty of some description. And it's caused by exactly the same hormonal changes that are going to uh, happen to you or probably are already starting to happen for you. We turned off. There's no view of anything. Oh, right. Good. What a great question. Thank you for that, Peter. David started waving at me frantically. I thought maybe the car was on fire, but it isn't. Trishala is now going to explain to you why it is that she had to leave the den of Ribbon, the hyena. Yes, everyone. While you look at the gorgeous last a few rays of the sun setting behind the horizon, I'll explain to you that, quite simply, once the adults, and oh, there are no adults at the den, we cannot be at the den. And that comes down again to what I explained about how curious hyena cubs can be. That if they see the vehicle, they may come out, they may hear the vehicle, um, hear us shuffling, may think that there's another hyena around. Whatever it is, we don't want to draw them out. Because if we do draw them out, then we put them at risk without the protection of an adult. In which case, it will end very badly for us. Sorry, I'm turning around to try and... Uh, Owen and I were having a, a bit of a, an argument about which side, the east or the west, was looking better. And I wanted to prompt him to go to the east, please. Because the moon was looking stunning, but is now hiding behind some clouds. Um, also, predators like lions or leopards more so lions when it comes to hyenas, will happily attack a hyena cub or other predators that occupy a similar niche to them. That is, have a similar job in the bush to them because by doing that, they're eliminating competition. So the last thing we want is to lure out a cub unintentionally without an adult to instruct it or um, provide it any attention. So there we go. That is why we have to leave the den when there aren't any adults around. In fact, that's even more important than the darkness that comes. Because we have an infrared light, we can stay when light is not perfect, but we don't want to be there when it's too dark. Um, but an adult not being around even trumps that. And that's because even in the day, if an adult's not there, we cannot be there. I hope that mends some of the broken hearts but we had to do what was best. Beautiful, don't you think? Absolutely beautiful. There's a couple, I guess, discussions on whether this is helpful or a hindrance to our predators because, you know, a full moon like this offers a lot of light. Um, and that means that herbivores or prey species will have more light to collect and detect predators in the grass, while predators will also have more light to detect any prey items. So I think personally it'll benefit the herbivores more than the predators. Now that is very true. Nikki at Anbion's in Gala has those lions who definitely have some prey items on the mind. Hopefully this moon will be helpful to them. So the whole pride has now started moving down. Remember we said they might go down to the water to drink, so they're actually on their way now to, down to the water. And this big male is, uh, is lingering at the back, and the other youngster, or the younger male has moved off to the left. But for now, let's follow this 
pride and see if they eventually get down to that water hole. You just never know what they can find on their way there. We'll try and keep quite a good distance from where we are with them at the moment. Leah, I would... Leah, nine years old from Joburg, asking how long would lions be able to go without water? So, probably three, four days. And they'll go with, without water. But if they can, they'll try and drink at least once a day. Um, and if they can't drink in a day, they'll, they'll drink at least every second day. Just stop and have a look. See this male is just now listening off to the left now as we are just as we park the vehicle here we can hear that other young male moving left of us at the moment let's just follow them for another little while so to give you an idea it is quite dense where we are now but eventually as we drive it starts opening up to these big grasslands and we don't know maybe there could be some zebra or wildebeest that have moved into that um, open areas, especially with it being full moon. Just want to stop on top of this little rise so we can have a look. We'll just notice like as the pride is moving how now and then they lift up their heads and they're actually smelling the air probably smelling if there's anything around Now you were asking how far would you be able to to hear a lion, like, or how far would a lion be able to hear another lion? So it's a very interesting question. I've never thought about it. I've never uh, done further research in that. But I would say probably up to 10 kilometers away. So let's say around about five miles. That's what I would estimate um, how far they'll be able to hear each other. and see if we can squeeze slightly closer. All right, so let's quickly, we'll head back to James uh, while we are following these lines for the next little while. David swears blind that there are leopard tracks on this road. I'm suspicious myself. Where are they, David? I'll see them in a bit, will I? Well, not unless that leopard was walking in luminous paint. Anyway, there is a possibility, very remote, that there could have been a leopard on this road some stage in the last year or so. Oh, there it is. The ultimate faithful. Do you see it, David? Yes. We're going to go to infrared in five, four, three, two, one. Oh, and as we did it, the bunny disappeared. There was a scrub hair, everybody. And it has absconded to the left. Where are you? Oh, there it is. 
You see it there, David. I didn't crawl to come in. Yanni, there are many different spot lighting techniques. Have you got the rabbit there, David? Like oh, we have an IR light failure. I should just bathe it in the wash. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, there are a number of different spot lighting techniques one can employ when out here in the wilderness, and everybody has their own spot lighting technique. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how effective uh, my particular one is. I don't really shake it like this when I drive, but I did have a tracker that used to do that at and beyond and Gala, believe it or not. He was a magnificent tracker, and he used to do this. And I said to him once, I said, there's no ways you can possibly see anything doing that. And then he'd go, chameleon, leopard, snake, Jeanette. And he was really effective with it. Then I drove with another chap who was much more spiritual about his spotlight. And he looked like he was conducting Swan Lake. And then another guy who would paint all the trees. And then I had a colleague called Jamie who used to do it like this. She drove like this. For hours on end, she'd hold her arm up. I don't know how she did it. And she did the lighthouse technique. Oh, I'm not sure which technique is the most effective. I also drove with another chap who was, um, shall we say, about three decades past retirement age. And he used to sit on the front and he'd shine like this and then you'd see the spotlight stop. And slowly it would dip down as he fell asleep on the front seat. And then he'd be up again and it would shine. And then it would dip down. Yeah, really. David, what is going on back there? Are we, are we dragging a branch? Oh, all right, we'll try and get that, what sounds like a vast forest under the vehicle out, while you go to Trish, who's got a spider. Yes, I have a spider. I do love spiders. One of my favorite things to look at out in the bush, and this is a garden orb weaver. You can see that kind of serrated abdomen. Sorry, that's my spotlight to take an eeker there. You don't want to spotlight the entire, you don't want to spotlight on the animal. You kind of want to spotlight away and let the light bounce onto it. That's my technique, everyone. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous garden, or garden orb weaver. She's got some males around her. They are particularly tiny. She seems to be gobbling up some of her, her silk as she goes. Now, generally, orb weavers don't take down their entire webs every evening, like many other spiders do. But occasionally, when the condition is not good, the condition of their web, that is, especially since they make such large webs, lots of things can damage the different bits, then they'll chomp some up and then re-spin in the morning. The males are those little things that are walking about on the web. Yes, they're very, very, very tiny. And they will all be trying their luck, basically not to be eaten. Some are not so lucky. But that happens more uh, or less often than you may think. It's quoted more often than it actually happens. Because remember, the females also want to have youngsters called spiderlings. Now you can't see her underside, uh, her the underside of her abnum, abdomen where she's got her spinnerets, but that's what she was touching just now. Isn't she just stunning? I think so. Hi.
Hi, Flair. You'd like to know a female spider is always bigger than the males? It is not always the case. For the smaller spiders, that may not be the case. The larger orb weavers, that is mostly the case. I can't think of one where that's not the case for the large spiders. I mean, the orb weaving spiders. Um, but if I know one thing about biology, I know that um, there's always an exception. But for orb weavers, orb weavers, the females are generally, in fact, mostly larger than the males. Unfortunately, when it comes to biology and ecology and all of that kind of thing, male, males are disposable species. Hi, Milan. You'd like to know, are these spiders venomous? Almost all spiders are venomous. In fact, all are. And they have fangs, or chelicerae, that they can inject their prey with. But it's not harmful to us. That's really, really important. Because they need to be able to kill their prey and inject it with digestive juices and then suck it all up like a straw. And in order to do that, they do need... They do need... Um, Venom. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust my hand quickly because it's cramping. There we, there we go. There we go. So all of them do need venom in order to actually kill their prey. Sometimes I think how... Almost inconceivable it must be to be a prey item stuck on the web of a spider. And all you are is stuck. The more you struggle, the more the spider will notice you. You can't die yet because you have nothing injected in you yet, so you're not even unconscious. You're just there, sitting, lingering. And the more you wriggle to get out, final attempts to just wriggle and break free, but you can't. And that's what gets the spider's attention, and she comes waltzing over with her tarsus, which are basically her feet with claws hanging off the web towards you and then only then will you get relief from your predicament Sid Sid you'd like to know if spiders sleep spiders will sleep all animals need to rest um, some animals do it differently where they may basically give halves of their brain sleep at a time like a chameleon, but a spider will sleep, but it is very hard to see that. They'll just remain immobile for a little bit. Without sleep, remember, we cannot, we cannot function. At least all animals have some form of rest. Really, really cool. I love these guys. Well, we've had a wonderful drive this afternoon, I think. We've managed to get some awesome elephant sightings, not to mention the lions. So from James, Nikki and I, thank you for your questions, your comments and for watching. We'll see you in the morning for Sunrise Safari.